Good afternoon. The next item of business today is a Members' Business Debate on Motion 7560 in the name of Ruth Maguire on flexible working, maximising talent and driving inclusive growth. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. I would ask members who wish to speak to press their request to speak buttons now and I call on Ruth Maguire to open the debate. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I'd like to thank colleagues from across the Chamber who signed the motion allowing this debate to take place, and I look forward to listening to their contributions. Colleagues will note that Family Friendly Working Scotland were involved in the production of the report cited in the motion. I'm grateful to Lisa, Nikki and their colleagues for their tireless work to promote flexible working practices, and would also like to extend my personal thanks for their support in organising a business briefing, breakfast business briefing, which is quite difficult to say, for local businesses, um, which I held in Irvine earlier this month. And I'll speak about that a little bit later. Firstly, though, I'd like to focus on the report. As the motion states, this is a groundbreaking report in and of itself, representing the first time that the ratio, ratio of quality jobs advertised as open to flexible working in Scotland has been researched. And its findings are just as remarkable setting out how demand for flexible working far outstrips supply, with just over a third of people in Scotland seeking part-time or flexible vacancies, whilst only around 11% of quality jobs are currently advertised as such. And I say advertised as such because the report also highlights the frustrating fact that many employers who would be op open to flexible working and who provide it for existing employees do not advertise it as such in their recruitment ads. So we have a twofold problem low availability of quality flexible working jobs and poor advertisement of those that do exist. This flexible jobs market deficit has many negative consequences for individuals as well as for our wider society and economy. It can mean that there's a talent bottleneck, particularly for women. It means that a significant number of well-qualified people become trapped in low paid and part-time work because they need flexibility but can't find a quality part-time or flexible job. Again, this has a particular impact on women, many of whom have caring responsibilities, something that Graham Day will speak to in his contribution. And it means that employers are missing out on hiring the best and the most diverse talent to grow their business, including women returners, older workers and disabled people, as well as those simply seeking to work differently. So addressing this, expanding the availability and promotion of flexible working would help to create a fairer Scotland and a stronger economy one founded on inclusive growth and greater gender equality. And the inclusive and inclusive growth is crucial, meaning the economic growth that takes everyone along. Jobs with good working conditions which pay at least the living wage. I know many of my colleagues are registered as living wage empl employers and would be, uh, encourage them to encourage the, uh, companies within their constituencies to join them. Flexible working can provide a better balance between home and work life for families across the country. It would allow more women to progress in their careers whilst balancing work with family life. It would allow qualified and motivated people to thrive and to contribute in a way that's right for them. And it would deliver real benefits for business and the wider economy, with more loyal, productive and motivated employees who feel valued and supported. The good news is that positive strides have already been taken to normalise and to reap the benefits of flexible working. It's a key ask of the Scottish Business Pledge, along with the living wage. It was central to the report on the economic potential of closing the gender pay gap produced by the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee in June. And my friend and colleague Gillian Martin will speak to that later. And organisations such as Family Friendly Working Scotland and Working Families already are already providing excellent guidance and resources for employers to adapt their recruitment practices, in particular by using the Happy to Talk Flexible Working strapline. Of course, many employers from big global corporations to small local businesses and everything in between have already discovered the benefits of fair and flexible working with great results. As I mentioned at the beginning of my speech, I recently held a breakfast briefing event for local businesses. And I'd like to conclude by sharing some concrete examples of flexible working and the benefits it's brought to local businesses in my constituency. One of the speakers we had was Victoria Edwards, who's the CEO of Irvine-based call centre VOCA. I first came into contact with Victoria when I was promoting the living wage and couldn't have hoped for a better employer to have had in my constituency. VOCA is the first call centre in Scotland to pay the real living wage. 
The company also doesn't use exploitative zero-hours contracts and supports flexible working and good work-life balance for their employees. As Victoria explained to us at the briefing, call centres normally have a terrible representation for working conditions and can be really difficult to recruit for. However, thanks to her flexible and fair approach to her employees, she no longer has to use recruitment agencies in her business and has a loyal and hard-working staff. We also heard from Jim Gallagher, director of Ayrshire-based Gallagher Healthcare, which comprises eight community pharmacies, another customer-facing business. He told us about an employee who started off with his company as a Saturday girl, earning money as a school student. She went to university, got qualified, and then came back to the business as a qualified pharmacist. Worked her way up, which included taking two lots of maternity leave, coming back to work flexibly in different ways as she raised her family. Jim explained she was a trusted employee and they wanted to support her and crucially they also wanted to keep her talent. Now the founder of that company is working flexibly to look after her own grandson. She gave up her superintendent pharmacist position to Gillian who is now leading on this. So the most senior pharmaceutical role in the business. From Saturday staff to superintendent pharmacist. She stayed on throughout as she was given flexibility during times that mattered. And now the business benefits from her experience and her knowledge of the customers at a time when the founder wants and needs to flex her role. Where flexible working is already practiced, the benefits to individuals, families and businesses are clear. What's also clear, presiding officer, is the huge potential for growing the flexible jobs market even further. All we have to do is seize it. Thank you very much. I now call Gillian Martin to be followed by Jimmy Halko Johnson. Gillian Martin. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and thank you to Ruth McGuire for securing this very important debate on an issue that affects many working families, and I include my own in that. As a member of the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee, I was keen to have issues around the causes of the gender pay gap investigated, and the result of this was an inquiry into the reasons why many hard-working, talented and highly qualified women do not earn the same as their male counterparts and do not have the same access to high earning positions or career progressions throughout their, their career. Over six weeks of evidence gathering, one phrase kept on cropping up and that was lack of access to flexible working arrangements. We found this single issue pushed able women with caring responsibilities into lower paid work, shift work, zero hours work and work under their skill set. And I always tell this personal story when talking about flexible working. Nearly 20 years ago, I worked in a company which was undergoing their investors and people assessment. And quite a few of us employees decided that we would ask the managing director if he would consider implementing flexible working practices, not just women, men and women throughout the company. Core office hours were 9 to 5.30 p.m., but we wanted the option to start our day any time between 7 and 10 a.m. and end it between 4 and 6.30 p.m. As long as people worked their contractual hours over a period of a month and didn't miss any scheduled appointments or meetings, we reckoned you could still have flexibility. And the MD was really sceptical. He was convinced that it would be abused and it would adversely affect productivity and his bottom line. But in fairness to him, he said he'd allow a six-month pilot. And at the end of the period, he called a staff meeting and announced... Uh, to us his final analysis and it was this the productivity of the staff rose and it seemed that all staff had managed their time better people did not take advantage no one did less than their contracted hours in fact he found that many did more there was a drop in the amount of staff taking time out of the day for appointments like doctors and dentists because they used their flexi time for that and sick leave had more than halved he also said that people seemed happier, people were less stressed. They wouldn't be battling through the rush hour traffic every day to get there in time. And they weren't spending as long as, uh, uh, time in their cars, you know, useless time where you can do nothing, when they could actually avoid the traffic and get to work a lot quicker. And the work doesn't get, just get done, it got done faster and it got done better, he reckoned. If you'd come in at 7 a.m., you'd be delivering work ahead of schedule. So he reluctantly took on this pilot but he became almost evangelical about the, 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 the benefits of flexible working. And what he discovered just in that six month period were just short term effects. Companies who came to tell us in the, the gender pay gap inquiry about how they tackled the gender pay gap and were very positive about flexible working arrangements, they told us that employees are less likely to leave a job with flexible working to find alternative employment that they worked in with their caring responsibilities. 
Employees felt more trusted and then, as a result, more valued, so they stuck around. Flexible workers are also less likely to call in sick. And in the world, uh, the world of work, one of the major overheads is recruitment and retention, and another is the time lost due to sick leave. And flexibility isn't just about start and finish time, it also can be about location. So flexible working can include flexibility about whether you work from home. Highly qualified people, not just women, because this affects all, all family members, and I would say that flexible working is something that could be an advantage to anyone, regardless of whether they have care and responsibilities or not. Highly qualified people who might be finding it hard to a job that fits into their care and responsibilities might prioritise working a flexible working schedule over some of the more co of costly incentives you might otherwise offer to entice people into your workplace. Um, and I, I just want to end by saying that I don't just give speeches on flexible work. My office here in Parliament and my constituency office are also flexible working environments. And if it works for me and my staff, it might work for an awful lot of other uh, employees, employers rather. Thank you. I call Jimmy Halcro Johnson to be followed by Jackie Bailey. Jimmy Halcro Johnson. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Um, I congratulate Ruth, Ruth McGuire for securing this debate today, uh, and I'd like to begin by welcoming the support shown by both the UK governments, uh, UK and Scottish governments, to flexible working in recent years. Other men members have already spoken, and I'm sure others uh, will as the debate continues about just some of the benefits of flexibility in the workplace, and it's positive that we are discussing it here today. A step change in the political approach to flexible working was made in 2014 when the UK government granted all employees a right to request flexible working. Since then, we've also seen con considerable steps uh, forward in shared parental leave and free childcare, the latter being expanded by the UK, uh, across the UK by the actions of its various administrations. As well as illegal entitlements, cultural change has to follow if flexible working is to become commonplace. Incorporating commitments to flexible working in the Scottish Business Pledge and the Scottish Government's Fair Work Programme also represent a positive contribution to change. But it's clear that we still have a considerable way to go to, to embed that cultural shift. Earlier this month, the TUC pointed to a survey of young parents in low-paying jobs, with two out of five seeing themselves as being penalised with fewer hours and worse shifts for requesting flexible working. The aspiration of both governments must be to create long-term and enduring change in working practices if the benefits are to be realised. To turn to my own region, the time-wise analysis uh, that we are debating today noted that the Highlands had a slightly lower than average level of flexible jobs that pay over 20,000 a year at 11.6%. There are certainly challenges in many rural areas around Scotland for businesses to deliver flexible working. Last year, the Institute of Directors survey noted that half of members would be more inclined to offer flexible, flexibility in working arrangements if there was greater availability of fast, reliable broadband. We know that parts of the Highlands and Islands regions are comparatively low paid and have lower than average levels of professional jobs available. Flexible working could well provide a benefit to regions like ours, making it an increasingly attractive place to live and work, but the infrastructure to support it must be in place. The TimeWise analysis also showed 58% of job seekers were seeking part-time work only, while noting that transitioning to part-time was often accompanied by a drop in status and hourly pay. In addition to the human cost, this also represents a waste of economic resource. Individual, individuals who seek shorter um, hours in place of flexibility are pushed into lower skilled, lower paying jobs, and this benefits no one. The Chamber will be aware that I sit on the Economy Committee and that flexible working arose during its recent gender pay gap inquiry, which happened before I was a member of the committee. But among the committee's findings were that flexibility can be valued as much as employee benefits or salary increases. Ultimately, it concluded flexible working can promote people staying in on work and returning to the workplace after break, such as parental leave. In its report, the committee also made a number of recommendations, and it'd be interesting to hear if the minister could set out where any progress had been made. The first was a recommendation that the Scottish Government collect data on both requests for flexible working and how many of these are successful across both the public and private sector. It would, also, um, it would also be welcome if we could hear more about how the public sector is leading more widely on flexible working and the uptake of flexible working arrangements, not only directly within the Scottish Government, but also across schools, police and NHS particularly. We are still in the early stages of building flexible working, in, in, uh, sorry, flexibility into working practices. With the correct support from government and business in the coming years, change can come and has the potential to be substantial. I'd again thank uh, Ruth Maguire for bringing this debate to Parliament. 
Thank you. Jackie Bailey to be followed by Graeme D. Jackie Bailey. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Can I too commend Ruth Maguire for securing this debate today? And, you know, in a departure for me, let me commend the Scottish Government too and Family Friendly Working Scotland for commissioning the report because it's only with evidence. I can see I've shocked the Minister. Um, <laughs> but it is only with evidence that we can start to understand the nature of the challenge and also the nature of the opportunity because flexible working is a real opportunity that we should exploit in the interests of the economy. Can I at the outset pay tribute to Family Friendly Working Scotland um, and to one of their directors, Lisa Gallagher. I used to know Lisa in a very different context when she worked with international street newspapers. So I'm pleased to see that she and the organization is all about encouraging employers in Scotland to engage in flexible working practices and that they actually follow by example by doing it themselves. Can I draw the Parliament's attention, as others have done, to the recent report from the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee? No small change, the economic potential of closing the gender pay gap. And tucked in there um, are some recommendations about flexible working, because members considered flexible working very much as part of our inquiry. We noted, and you know, I, I, with all due respect to the Conservative benches, um, we do note that employers are obliged under the Employment Rights Act of 1996 to consider flexible working requests. But that's quite different. That, that for me, is a minimum position. It's very different when what you need is a change of culture, where people feel supported, where you have the right um, flexible working policies, yes, but you have that positive work environment too. And we recognise that flexible working needs to be available career long. There are clear benefits for parents, both men and women, who share childcare responsibilities. There are benefits for people sharing caring responsibilities too. But it, there are also benefits for people who are just simply getting older and who, as they approach retirement, want to work less. But for an employer, you retain the knowledge in the organisation. So a lack of flexible working costs our economy. Women, and it could indeed be others too, but let, let me just say women, are underemployed, their skills underutilized, they end up working in positions well below their level of qualification, and that is something that doesn't benefit our economy. Um, the Scottish Women's Convention told us in the committee, many women are unable or unwilling to work the same hours as they did before they had children, but it doesn't affect their ability to do the job. Others told us about the very positive impact in terms of the economy and growth, but it's also positive for people that want to engage in flexible working. So, presiding officer, it's good for workers, it's good for business, it's good for the economy. What's not to like? Some of the recommendations we aimed at the, the government um, and indeed the parliament presiding officer whilst you're here, we ask that the Scottish government, its agencies and the Scottish parliament um, ensured that all jobs were advertised as flexible, agile, or part-time, that you collect data um, as to what's actually going on in the public and private sectors, and that all job application forms had a commitment to flexible working within them. Because we know there's a long way to go. Only 11.9% of jobs are advertised as flexible. Demand far outstrips supply, and it poses a real barrier to progress. Something like 128,000 people mostly women, well qualified, they work part time, many of them working at a level well below their qualification level, earning less than £20,000, when in fact they could probably earn double, if not more that. That's a real opportunity lost. So I would ask the Scottish Government to bend, bed in a commitment to flexible working to everything that we do or everything that the government can influence. So whether it's the government, whether it's the parliament, whether it's the public sector and our colleagues delivering um, in local government, or whether it's the private sector through procurement or the Scottish Business Pledge. This isn't just a nice thing to do. It matters to our economy, and it matters so that we as a society make use of all of our talents. Thank you very much. And I call in Graeme Dee to be followed by Jeremy Balfour. Graeme Dee. Uh, Presiding officer, thank you. And can I, as is customary, congratulate Ruth Maguire on bringing this matter to the Chamber because the Time Wise report raises some very important issues. Amongst other things, the research makes an important distinction about the availability of flexible working, noting that the majority of employers offer flexible working to employees they know and trust, uh, with it seen as a retention tool. On the other hand, when it comes to recruitment, 
Most employers fail to use flexible working as a factor to attract people, and the report states that there seems to be a default position of advertising the jobs as full-time ones, even when they are seeking to replace someone who is working part-time, and similarly failing to note the option of working on a flexible basis, even when the previous occupant at the post was able to do just that. There is a lesson to be learned by all of us there, and that includes we MSPs in our role as employers. Put simply, if employers do not change the way they advertise, they run the risk of missing out on excellent staff. People need to know that they can ask for flexible working, and spelling that out in adverts will, of course, help prospective employees identify that it is on offer, perhaps making the difference between applying or not. In terms of advertising, the Angus area, which I represent, does perform relatively well, with 13 per cent of job adverts with salaries of £20,000 or more, noting flexible working opportunities. However, low-skill part-time roles are currently being taken by overqualified staff who have been pushed into roles in order to, take the, to get the flexibility they need. And we may well have the makings of a vicious circle here as those with appropriate skills become unfairly locked out of the labour market. Let me highlight a very good practice example around flexible working for a significant sector of our community, and that is carers. The Carer Positive Initiative, while it is not focused on the advertising undertaken by employers, does seek to provide carers with that degree of flexibility so that they can manage their employment and caring responsibilities. I was delighted to host an event here at the beginning of the year where the Scottish Parliament received its accreditation. Across Scotland now there are 81 accredited employers who have 2,700 uh, uh, 272,255 staff, sorry. These range from councils and health boards to large companies such as Scottish Gas and Standard Life. It isn't just about the obvious, such as accommodating part-time working, flexi-time, job sharing or granting emergency leave when it's needed. Carer Positive highlights two other things, like ensuring carers know that they're allowed to take a call at work or that there is somewhere private for them to do so. Fife Council, for example, allows carers who wish to access the Council's counselling service during work time to do just that. Carers should feel comfortable making their employers aware of their responsibilities, but also shouldn't feel under any obligation to do so. Perhaps a carer positive logo on an advert would make people aware uh, of that, uh, prospect, that, that the prospective employer is willing to listen to the person's need. Uh, Voluntary Action Shetland is another example. Uh, it lets new starts know in the, in the staff induction pack that carers are welcome to identify themselves to the executive team or their team leader, but that they don't have to. So why should organisations become carer positive? What is in it for them? Caring responsibilities impact on people across the whole working age spectrum, but do tend to hit a peak when people will have gained valuable skills and experience. Carers leaving the workforce can not only have a negative impact on that individual's well-being and their financial circumstances, but also be damaging to the employers and the wider economy. As the population ages and the number of carers rises, this cumulative impact is only going to increase. Supporting carers to remain productively in work delivers real benefits to employers with evidence showing increased morale, reduced stress and sickness absence, increased productivity and in helping to attract and retain experienced staff. Without support, combining employment and caring can lead to stress, exhaustion and people not performing to their full potential. Losing valuable members of staff can result in a loss of skills, knowledge and experience as well as leading to increased recruitment and training costs. Becoming carer positive is not without its challenges for small businesses. I recognise that. But where it can be implemented, flexible working, as delivered by the Carer Positive Initiative, is quite simply a win-win. Presiding officer. Thank you, Roger. Called Jeremy Belfort, followed by Ash Denham. Jeremy Belfort. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. And can I also congratulate Ruth Maguire on securing this debate on this important issue? The, the timing of the debate is particularly apt, as next week it's National Work Life Week. And this is an opportunity for both employers and employees to focus on well-being at work and work-life balance. I think it's important to stress that both employers and employees can gain from flexible working opportunities, as both parties have the flexibility to organise their work arrangements in a way that suits them. For employees, flexible working allows them a better balance in their home life, with the responsibilities at work. In today's society, both men and women want to find a balance between work, family and caring responsibilities, which are shared more equally, perhaps not fully, but they were when I was growing up. 
For employees and businesses, flexible working can help retain staff and hold on to experienced and skilled staff. It can offer flexible hours, open up a new pool of talent when you're recruiting more skills. Uh, just uh, a month ago, I have uh, employed a new person uh, working for me here at the Parliament. She was very keen to have flexible hours, um, as was another member of my staff, and together they now have flexible hours which suits them and gives me the best talent uh, within the Parliament. Yet we know that from the UK time-wise, flexible jobs index that less than one in 10 quality job vacancies mention the option to work flexibly at the point of hire. If people do not see that on the advert, they are simply not going to um, apply for the job. Jobs advertised with flexibility are so scarce that 77% of part-time workers feel trapped in their current role. A report commissioned by the Joseph Rowntree Foundation in 2016 found that mothers and older workers are particularly disadvantaged by the lack of quality, flexible jobs. As convener of the CPG on disability, I know from having listened to many individuals that disabled people being in work feel that flexibility would give them far more in regard to finding the right job that they want. Most disabled people want to contribute to society, want to maximise their independent living, reduce social isolation and build friendships. A report by Disability Agenda Scotland about what life is really like in Scotland today for disabled people identified that some disabled people are not able to work and that needs to be recognised and supported. But for others, the focus needs to shift from what people can't do to what they can do, to take advantage of their talents and skills. Evidence demonstrates that young disabled people have a similar level of career aspiration at the age of 16, along with their peer group. But by the time they are 26, they are four times more likely to be unemployed. We need to foster that early aspiration and reinforce with support, which enables the young person to take control of their own journey towards into employment. I was very fortunate that when I got my first job from leaving university, my employer said to me, what help do you need to be able to do the job? And there was a flexibility there that allowed me to start off in my career. I welcome the vision of a Fair Work Convention to create an environment that enables people in Scotland to have a working life where fair work drives success, well-being and prosperity for all individuals, businesses, organisations and society. To achieve this vision, we need to encourage more employers to take a proactive approach and use flexibility as an employee benefit that will attract talent. I would urge the Scottish Government to champion the business and social benefits of flexible hiring to employers in Scotland and to make a concerted effort to reduce the disability employment gap by ensuring flexible working is key not only to how Scottish Government works, this Parliament works, but to local authorities and to other businesses across the Scotland. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you. Call Ash Denham to be followed by the Minister. Ash Denham. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I would also add my thanks to Ruth Maguire for securing this debate today in the Chamber. And from the contributions that we've already heard today, it has become clear that flexible working can do a great deal of good for both Scottish businesses and for working families. And indeed, we are in challenging times at the moment, and that requires society to be more creative and open to new ideas to ensure that Scotland's workforce and economy do not suffer. On top of Brexit, casting shadows of uncertainty, the average age of Scotland's population is projected to increase. Couple that with unknowns around EU nationals' right to continue working in the UK, and it's without a doubt that attracting more working age people to work in Scotland must be a top priority. Flexible working is one such creative strategy that can help Scottish businesses attract and keep more talent. And the numbers here speak for themselves. 
Just over a third of unemployed people looking for work in Scotland are seeking part-time or flexible vacancies. And these people are also better qualified than the counterparts who are looking for full-time work. Yet only 11.9% of quality jobs in Scotland are advertised with flexible working options. Now, while this is above the UK average, we should push where we can for this number to be higher in order to meet the demand that exists for flexible working. And such demand is further exemplified by 92% of millennials ranking this workplace flexibility as a top priority for them when selecting jobs. And this is the prime demographic Scotland should be working to recruit at the moment as our current population ages. Research has also shown that flexible working boosts employee productivity and retention and reduces absenteeism. Take, for example, the Glasgow-based Pursuit Marketing. They instituted a four-day work week for all their employees, and this helped the company achieve a 500% increase in job applications, as well as a 32% boost in worker productivity and a 98% staff retention rate. Clearly, flexible working then can help foster the three main drivers of economic development, participation in the labour market, productivity and population growth. And as such, the promotion of flexible working should have a defined place in Scotland's economic development strategy. But the benefits of a flexible job are not merely financial, as we've heard already. A report commissioned by the Scottish Government and Family Friendly Working Scotland found that 77% of part-time workers feel trapped in their current roles. And that's because maybe they've taken on a part-time job that enables them to attend to other priorities in their life. Maybe that would be caring responsibilities or something else. But that's often at the expense of their career progression. And sometimes they then drop out of the labour market altogether. This phenomenon is what the report calls a talent bottleneck, and it has been known to cause a particular impact on women. And additionally, the report cited a study by the Joseph Roundtree Foundation, which states that mothers, older workers, and disabled people are particularly disadvantaged by the lack of good quality, flexible jobs. No one, want, um, no one who wants to work should be kept from doing so. And this isn't about a lack of skills, but a, about a lack of opportunities. Um, parents shouldn't have to choose between raising their children and advancing their careers. Somebody with a disability or health issues or someone that's caring shouldn't have to be held back professionally. And I don't believe they need to be because flexible working offers that solution to ending the divide between quality of life and quality of work. So we should all be talking about it as much as we can and continuing that conversation with businesses and in our constituencies. Um, I can see that I'm running out of time, so I will just say that flexible working, it makes sense. It makes sense for employers and it makes sense for the country as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Denham. I now call on the Minister to conclude the debate. Thank you very much, President Officer. And can I join with other members in thanking Ruth McGuire for bringing forward this uh, debate today? I'm uh, very happy to be responding uh, on behalf of the Scottish Government. And can I uh, heed the call that's laid out? in the motion that uh, we collectively, individually, as members of the Scottish Parliament, should be doing all we can uh, to promote flexible working uh, in our respective uh, areas. Uh, can I uh, echo Ruth Maguire's uh, thanking for uh, family-friendly working uh, Scotland? Can I echo her thanks? They are a fantastic organisation of which the Scottish Government is a, uh, both a, a funder and uh, an active uh, participant in. Uh, she uh, mentioned that she has some difficulty uttering the term business breakfast briefing. I should say I often have difficulty uttering the term family friendly working Scotland. They've got it written out in front of me because we're always doing it in the context of talking about flexible working. So I always want to throw the uh, word flexible uh, in there. I can also say I'm delighted I've spoken in this debate because it's allowed uh, me to come to the pinnacle of my political experience. Jackie Bailey came to speak in a debate where she praised the Scottish Government as a as a seminal uh, moment in the history of this parliament. Uh, this is a, a timely debate, though, because of, of three upcoming events. Uh, firstly, tomorrow's business in the, the parliament event is an opportunity to hear about the, the benefits, benefits of flexible working practices at one of the, the workshop sessions, I understand, has been uh, set up. Secondly, as Jeremy Balfour said, next week is uh, National Work Life uh, Week. Uh, and thirdly, as has been mentioned quite extensively, uh, the, uh, there has been the, the inquiry by the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee into the Gender Pay Gap. Next week we will, of course, 
uh, debate uh, that uh, report, and I look forward to, to responding on behalf of uh, the government. Uh, as the time-wise report highlights the gap between uh, flexible uh, working and flexible hiring is uh, causing a, a talent uh, bottleneck, particularly uh, for women. Um, Gillian Martin set out that issue uh, very clearly, talking about her own uh, experience, uh, and she and uh, Jackie Bailey both uh, referred to the, the committee inquiry having picked up on this uh, issue, in particular under utilisation and, uh, of skills and low-paid part-time work are, as the committee inquiry heard, uh, contributing factors to uh, the gender pay gap. We will, of course, uh, debate that uh, matter in greater detail next week, but let me put on the record now, uh, President Officer, the Scottish Government's very uh, clear commitment to uh, seeing that gender pay gap uh, closed. Uh, without a, a flexible jobs market, uh, people uh, become trapped in low uh, paid time, uh, uh, paid part-time work, not because of a, a lack of skills, but because they need that job uh, flexibility. The skills of these workers are being underutilised by employers, and many drop out of the, the workplace altogether. Uh, Graeme Day rightly highlighted that point. He also spoke about the, the Carer Positive Initiative. Let me thank Mr Day, who is a, a champion for unpaid carers and also championing uh, the Carer Positive uh, uh, scheme. I have seen the difference it makes in both my previous ministerial role where I had uh, responsibility for uh, carers policy and in my uh, current one uh, as well. And of course the government will continue to promote that uh, scheme as a valuable part of the promotion of the, the flexible working agenda. Uh, the flexible uh, jobs uh, index also highlights the, the potential and the need for an expansion of the flexible jobs market that will have uh, benefits for employers, employees and their families and our overall uh, economy. Forward thinking uh, employers already understand the business case and are using flexibility as a, a key tool to attract a, a diverse range of talent in, uh, their, uh, into their organisations. Ruth Maguire uh, made that point, uh, and as a necessary one, that I think Ash Denham was quite right to pick up on this uh, as well, against the backdrop of what is a very welcome, uh, uh, strong performing uh, labour market at this moment in time. There are concerns about uh, certain skills gaps uh, emerging. There are concerns about the ability of employers to uh, fill those skill gaps from elsewhere. So if we're going to respond to those concerns, then we do need that new thinking uh, that uh, uh, Ash Denham uh, spoke of. We need to harness the talents of all our people. And part of that new thinking we need employers to engage in is thinking about flexible uh, employment. Uh, the greatest asset, of course, of any uh, business is being able to, to carve out their competitive edge uh, through their uh, workforce. Uh, reports published by a range of organisations have uh, reached the same conclusion. A diverse uh, workforce gives greater innovation and ultimately uh, business uh, growth to attract uh, top talent. I know that we need to have employers actively discussing flexible uh, working practices uh, with their uh, employees. And of course, we're, let me set out uh, very clearly uh, the Scottish, where the Scottish Government is advertising externally. For an external post, we uh, use the happy to talk flexible working uh, strapline. Uh, flexible working also helps employers retain their top talent. Uh, we also uh, want to uh, move uh, flexible working into the, the labour market uh, mainstream uh, in that sense as well. The benefits to, to workers and to employers doesn't uh, just apply to, to those with uh, specific uh, needs. It can benefit all uh, of the employees in a particular uh, workplace. Flexible working, including part-time uh, employment, can help uh, those with disabilities or long-term health conditions to access and sustain employment. And of course, uh, uh, in that regard, Jeremy Balfour uh, spoke about the, the need uh, to uh, take more effort to uh, uh, tackle the employment gap we see for those uh, with disabilities uh, as well. That is something that this government is very uh, clearly and firmly uh, fixed on uh, uh, taking forward uh, in uh, the years ahead of us. Um, the benefits of uh, flexible working for employees are, I think, self-evident uh, and obvious a better chance to strike a balance between uh, work and uh, other uh, commitments. But uh, we also know that there are, are benefits to uh, employers uh, as well. The evidence supports uh, the view that uh, flexible working feeds into better employee engagement, motivation and retention and uh, ultimately productivity, all important wins for uh, employers. So that's why it's important for employers to be willing uh, to engage in this agenda. And I thought it was very uh, telling to hear from uh, Gillian uh, Martin about her own personal experience where uh, she had uh, a somewhat reticent employer, at least willing to experiment, as it were, with uh, flex working, who ultimately moved from being uh, sceptical to being uh, an, uh, somewhat evangelical about the benefits of uh, flex working. That's where we need to get all uh, employers. We need to get them into 
to that space. Uh, let me just uh, close by uh, uh, commenting on the recommendations of uh, the report. Many of the recommendations uh, from the, the report we debate today essentially encourage us to, to maintain our direction of travel. We will continue to do that. We will continue uh, to use the Fair Work Agenda, the business place to develop a shared vision across government and business, across all sectors, uh, to uh, embed a flexible work and to embed a fair uh, work agenda uh, with the goal of uh, boosting productivity, competitiveness, um, employment, uh, fair work and workforce uh, engagement. I am very serious about that agenda. Uh, all the evidence shows uh, flexible working is not only good for the worker but also good uh, for uh, employers and in that sense it makes smart business practice and we continue to promote it, President Officer. Thank you very much and I thank the Minister and all the members for taking part in the Members' Business debate today. Uh, the next item of business, we're perhaps slightly ahead of where people expect, but this is a follow-on debate uh, and I'm glad to see virtually all the members are here. Uh, so our next item of business is a debate on motion 7905 in the name of Michael Matheson on stage one of the Domestic Abuse Scotland Bill. So I would ask those members who do wish to speak this debate to press their request to speak buttons now.